uh, se levante la mano que um, aprender en español otra vez. Okay. Si, si puede uh, escribir en español, se levante la mano. Okay. O oh, así, así. <laughs> ok. Um, ya, yeah. escriba sus notas uh, desde los papeles, sus sentimientos de esta experiencia. Sigue, por favor. Escriben, por favor. Escriben, por favor. ¿Me entendiste? ¿No? ¿Me entendiste? ¿No? Tú puedes, ¿verdad? Tú puedes, tú puedes. ¿Me entendiste, verdad? Más o menos. Más o menos, ok. Y, y uh, ella. Frente. ¿Me entendiste? ¿Puede escuchar mi voz? ¿Es más alto? ¿Suficiente? Oh, no. Mm -hmm. Ok. No comprendo. Ok. Pues, uh, en inglés. En inglés. Ok. Um, what I said was, write how you're feeling about this experience on your paper. Sigue. Do that. Do that now. Yes. Um, uh, let's get some uh, responses or reactions to the opening experience. Anyone? I'm speaking English now. <laughs> yeah. Yes, sir. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to interrupt you. If you can, because some of us are here um, virtually, if you can speak into one of the units, uh, that would be helpful. And also, Xavier in the back has a microphone. So having learned a little bit of Spanish, I could pick up on your general points, but there was certainly a lot of information that was going right over my head. So it was a little bit, I'd say, uncomfortable, although I understood sort of the general point of what, we were, what you were getting at. OK. OK. Anyone else? I thought it was interesting. Uh, Um, I thought it was very interesting. Um, I thought of it as like um, utilizing it in my classroom. I teach University 101 to uh, first generation low income college students. So I relayed that to um, me speaking in a di dialogue about for campus speak or using terminology uh, related to the campus and how students may not understand necessarily what I'm talking about. So um, I thought about as just being more intentional on like breaking down like the concept of what I'm talking about as um, far as it relates to my class. Okay. So I thought it was very interesting. Okay, great, great. Anyone else? Yes, ma'am. Well, we were talking about at the end, um, you were asking if we understood. Mm -hmm. And those of us who didn't understand didn't understand well enough to understand that we didn't understand. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> and that's something I do all the time in my classes. Do you understand? Do you get it? And if you don't know enough to not even answer the question, that that's really important. Yeah, yeah. And Luke, you are pretty much following? Uh, yes, sir. Um, I do speak Spanish. Yes. But uh, it was the same thing. I, I actually saw how when you asked uh, other people if uh, they understood, uh, there was no response there. Oh, yeah, yeah. So that there was that language barrier of you trying to reach yeah. out, but the other person, because they didn't speak the same language, couldn't actually uh, reach out and say, no, please repeat or, or change. Okay, thank, thank you so much. I wanted to go to that because I, was, I, I did ask at more than one point. I asked more than one point, do you understand me? Why didn't you all respond and say no? <laughs> you see? Uh, believe it or not, this is commonplace in some of our, our instructors, okay? So, I mean, we could go on, on about this. Let me go back a little bit. <laughs> this is our topic. I said that. I'm repeating myself now, <laughs> but in a different language. This is our topic, and I did say I'm Nate Kahn, who caught that. And I did mention that I'm associate director of CTE. 
I think some people start, then I start to lose people. <laughs> <laughs> and this is why I noted um, that um, most of you, well, everybody sat politely. Nobody seemed to get upset with me so much, but it was kind of like, all right. Is this workshop I signed up for? <laughs> Am I going to get anything out of this workshop? Maybe. How long is he going to talk like this? <laughs> okay. This is also, um, in the College of Education, we have focused a lot on culturally relevant, culturally responsive teaching, social justice, equity, diversity. And um, in many of our classes, uh, I was in among the faculty when we were having this discussion too. So in and among our classes, students tend to react a little differently, as you can imagine. Sometimes when you start saying those words, the wall goes up. So what I had done was I had uh, just brainstormed and thought, how can I reach my students, which I think about a lot. Uh, and so what I thought, I said, like, hey, why, I, why don't I just engage in an experience? And what I found is when I do, uh, because we, we prepare teachers, and I have taught for a long time out in classrooms before I came to the university, I have found that particularly my under, no, it's actually the graduate students too, but my undergraduate students, they start acting like the students I taught before I came to the university. Um, most of the time they sit politely like you, but then if I carry on a little bit, I find them, some will start leaning back in their chair maybe or start playing with something and trying to take a quick look at their <coughs> cell phone um, but they're all fat. Some of them like, what's he saying? What's he saying? So they're disrupting class. I'm trying to get a point across and they're interrupting. What's he saying? And then sometimes someone blurts out, he said, write down how you feel on your paper. You know, and that happens in the classroom also. What I noticed with us briefly is that we, um, we just kind of sat, many of us just sat there, a uh, couple of like, and most of you just sat, you did nothing. You just sat and looked at me. How many of you have seen this in your, your classes when you teach? Okay, this is, all right, so this is to move beyond just the speaking. It's about the cultural experience that's happening. Okay, they do some of the same things. And like, do you get it? It could be a statistics class, biostatistics class. It could be um, uh, engineering. It could be sociology. Whatever it is, I'm sitting there, I, I hear you, you're using some words that are outside of my vernacular, and um, I don't think I'm going to call as much of a fuss, I'll just sit there and hope it starts to make sense to me some way, somehow, or maybe, did you, did you get what you said? <laughs> All right, so it's, there's something very important then about um, uh, with this culturally responsive, uh, culturally relevant, or the other way around, either way, uh, a, a bird that we're dealing with, or burden, I would say in some cases, because it is kind of a burden, but it's very complex and very <coughs> complicated. It looks great on paper, and when we read about it, that's what we're going to just touch a little bit on today. There's a whole lot, as you can imagine, that goes into this, but this is just uh, to kind of help us think through some kind of thing. So just think about how you looked at me. Think about the degree to which, and I know there's part of this evaluation because I had to revise. That was one of my jobs, revise the evaluation. So to what degree were you active? To what degree were you attentive uh, to me? I wonder, you don't have to admit anything right now, but I'm wondering if anybody would be brave enough to say, I checked out. My mind went through the door, it went to um, the weekend, how many papers do I have to grade, what's the next lesson I have to teach, you know, that sort of thing. If you did that, you were just politely inattentive, which happens in our class as well. Okay, so we're going to try to uh, circumvent that. Okay, so as we continue on, your comments, um, your questions that you raise, you don't have to wait till the end. You are very welcome to uh, join in. I would like 
even really to get into more of a conversation, even going through each of these slides. Now, I want to tell you, though, I, as, uh, I would like for some participation to take place. I do not know it all. Sometimes, uh, and I think I can say this because there's not too many of us here, sometimes people of color talk about these kind of issues, but guess what? People of color aren't necessarily the experts. We all bring something to the table. Uh, so feel free uh, to, to interject at different times. This is what I'm going to hold to. And those of you who were at one of the previous diversity ones, they, they had uh, guidelines that were very similar uh, to this one. Uh, so I don't want to, um, to dwell on this too much, but um, I wanted to get into uh, some definitions that were... Uh, that may be useful to us, and I know you have uh, um, this noted on the handout. We made mention of culturally responsive pedagogy, made mention of cult culturally relative pedagogy. We did, there's nothing there that says anything about cultural competence that I want to touch on. Now, again, uh, as we go into this, this is some of the things that uh, the College of Education is exposing some of our teacher candidates to. Um, but I think there is a way to, to do this than what sometimes we have traditionally done, which is throw out these terms. And some, in some of the classes, uh, I know that uh, some of our teacher candidates haven't had the greatest of experience because while the intent is good, uh, the way it is done sets them back a little bit because, for example, when I'm looking around the room racially, I see that there are a lot of Caucasians in the room. I prefer to say Caucasians because I'm, I'm a science educator, and when we say white, I say, well, nobody in here is really white. <laughs> Not when you compare their skin color to the electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, and there's no one in here who's really black because uh, that has a certain uh, characteristic, and no one in here has skin color that uh, in that, that length, wavelength, okay? So I tend to address things a little bit differently. But I understand what people are talking about because we're really talking in ethnic terms. Okay, when we look up here, what do you see um, that is similar in all three definitions? Culture. Uh, I guess one thing that uh, I noticed was I see, I guess, the most common thing is like groups collective. So maybe that, that piece of understanding among, among bodies of people. OK. All right. So looking at some general kind of understanding and all, and I heard someone say a magic word. What's that? Uh, I don't know if I have the magic word. But um, I noticed that it, um, each of them refers to some um, positive effect on the student. Okay. That's individual or collective. That is important. That is important because it is so easy as human beings. My wife talks about this all the time. You being a psychologist, one of the thing, one of the tendencies for human beings is to point out negative things. Negative things seem to catch our attention more than anything else. For example, have you ever? Uh, uh, have seen or yourself have worn a beautiful light colored uh, shirt or blouse and maybe you inadvertently got a coffee stain or something that takes away from its beauty and do you know what people say a lot of times they will say uh, you got a spot on your shirt rather than celebrate the whole shirt what draws the attention is that spot that they feel detracts from its beauty. And so I'm glad you said what you did because so many uh, instances, we have so many instances in which um, individuals um, will look at the, the negative or the depreciating value rather than the appreciating. This fits all in with um, the focus of these three uh, uh, components, I'll say. 
All right. Have you noticed also where you see the word, I think I heard someone say, culture keeps coming up. All right, so let's move to, uh, I know it's on our, our next slide, but try to uh, stay yourself from that uh, for a moment. And I would like to know what culture means to you. Yes, sir? Um, I have like values, traditions, unspoken norms and understanding, usually shared through like common living lived experiences. Okay. And we just had a lived experience. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Uh, and that there are multiple intersections of culture, right? So like as many identity markers as you might have are as many cultural communities you might belong to, right? Like you might belong to um, a culture of femininity or a culture of race or a culture of religion or a culture of geographic space. So there, there are a lot of intersections of it. Okay. Yeah. A lot of intersections. Uh, so intersectionality comes in into play, which, um, all right, so when we go back and look at these cultures, so here, I find this very interesting. So in our, some of the scholarly writing, I'm not going to take us through the whole thing, but in some of our uh, scholarly writing, uh, I find where it's re, uh, referring to marginalized groups, particularly those who write about uh, African-American groups or groups coming from uh, African descent are included in a lot of writings, but culture uh, is um, broader than what most people have identified because they are focusing on the race component. Now, in the experience that I pre provided to us was more of a linguistic one, okay? I'm gonna come back, I gotta come back to this one a little bit. So even when we talk about culture, um, there are a number of beliefs. Actually, culture comes from two major disciplines, sociology and anthropology. Okay, so I'm just going to borrow from them generally that we're looking at beliefs and values that a group of people have, and they're similar. They can then make a culture. Um, certain ways that we are to behave. Uh, it could be, you know, this is how you interact with people who are older than you, or people who are younger than you, or people who have uh, gender differences. This is how you interact with them. Um, this is how you in interact with people who have a lot of money, people with hardly no money. They don't get the same treatment generally in a culture, well, depending on what the cultural values and beliefs are, and then there are the norms, so that's when we start looking at what is normal, and that's culturally defined, okay? Um, and then we already touched on the language, and I engaged you a little bit with that. And then uh, when we're looking at artifacts, you know, and this also includes type of clothing that one might wear or not wear. So uh, that comes in, and then the different kinds of symbols, not that, uh, I'm just using this as an example. One of the things that immediately jumps to mind are some of the gangs. You know, because I, I thought uh, for, I spent some time in the belly of Cincinnati Public Schools. You know, the, the better I became associated with the gang, the better off I was. For example, I actually had um, my students, the way I treated them, and they thought it was appropriate that they watched over my car. I didn't have to worry about uh, slash, slash tires or uh, any part of my car to face. They actually protected it, but it had to do with how I was treating them. Okay? And in several cases, we were actually even the same skin color. But just because you're same sp skin color doesn't mean you're of the same culture. Okay? So this is uh, uh, quite nuanced. So let me just touch back. Uh, uh, go back just a little bit then, even when we're talking about this cult culturally responsive, actually, Lori Latson-Billings, um, she talks about, when she talks about culturally relevant pedagogy, she's not talking about a uh, specific group's uh, culture, as uh, Dr. Gay <clears throat> talk, seems to talk more about that, uh, but 
uh, Lass Gloria Latson Billings is talking about more broadly. And then keep in mind where I'm going with all this is that we can set up culture in our own classes, okay? But what we have to do is teach them to become culturally competent. We do that verbally and non-verbally. And uh, the bottom line with cultural competence is that I have to be uh, comfortable in my own skin. If I'm not comfortable, well, I said skin, but I'm, I'm not talking about the physical, but within my being. Here's the thing. Once you and I are comfortable in who we are, that sets us up to be comfortable with people who are different than we are. Because a lot of times our insecurities about ourselves, our dislikes about ourselves, can then be projected onto other people. And then that's where things become problematic. We become uh, a little unstable with how we treat people. And we will either say things or disregard or exclude people then because that is manifesting some of inconsistencies within our own identities. Okay. Questions, comments? Okay. So this becomes really complex, which is, uh, we were talking about this, and so why don't you uh, uh, present something um, in regards uh, to this? And so, um, I'm just going to kind of uh, start pulling this more towards the teaching part. When we, as teachers, when we teach, there's a lot that we have on our plate. So the culturally relevant, culturally responsive, or even with the, those of us that are just dealing with individuals from a staff position, we are still doing some sort of teaching, that there's a lot that goes into this. And actually, this goes back uh, years ago, uh, looking at uh, some scholars talking about teaching in general. We have the content to teach, which is where I think we are at the university level pretty well set. You know, we know the content that we're going to teach. But have you considered who we are going to, whom we are going to teach? Because that brings in the learners, who they are, and the pedagogy, how we're going to deliver that information. How does that information lend itself to um, understanding of the students that are sitting in our class? Let's go back. Let's go back to the experience again. I knew what I was saying. Okay? And I don't, and Luis is, was right with me, although I'm, he probably was completely uh, right with me. I was not only speaking Spanish. I was speaking the Mexican dialect of Spanish. Did you pick that up? I don't know if my accent came through or not. Okay. I mean, for you, it's like, what accent? But if you were listening closely, you probably heard an accent, right? No. Um, for example, I lived in Guadalajara. That's different than what some of you would say if you saw the word. Uh, because, and my roommate who stayed with me down there, he says Guadalajara. <laughs> talk too much. Actually, it made such a difference that uh, when we had to have our clothes laundered, I, he would send me with his clothes, and I took, because he gave me a little money to do so. <laughs> and he still made out, because there, are no, there were no signs posted. And you, know, you just go, and you drop your clothes off, and then you come back, you pick them up, and they tell you how many pesos that cost. Mine was always far lower than his. So they actually, and the way I spoke, I just looked slightly different than I did back then. But the way I spoke, they thought I was of Aztecan descent. They didn't say I was American. They just kind of said, see, listen, listen to the way he talks. And while, yes, I did take Spanish. I took Spanish, too. I took Spanish to get an easy A in high school. But I learned Spanish growing up. And I learned from Mexican migrant workers that came and populated our town. That's, that's who I learned from. And so I learned to say different things, different ways. For example, remember I started off buenos dias? Uh, most, most of you know what that means, right? I mean, you don't have too much Spanish, no. But what if I said, que onda? 
How would you answer? So I say, ¿Qué onda? Okay, tell me, ¿Qué onda? Bien. Oh, no, no, you say it to me. Oh. ¿Qué onda? ¿Qué onda? ¿Estás onda? That's the response. Okay, now, um, help me out, Luis. That does not translate. But it is, I mean, I mean, it doesn't translate yeah, directly. Correct. But yeah. he didn't translate, he interpreted. Okay? And it is, you're right. It is, it's, it's like the, um, what we say in my African-American neighborhood. What's up? And then we would respond, it's you, man. <laughs> I mean, how does that fit together? Now, so, all right, so I mentioned uh, about, that's the language part of the culture. But even, uh, you know, we've got to take in tone. We've got to take in that there's expression uh, that happens. And, and so um, what we see here is, is that there's this, this interplay of what we need to do. So where am I, what am I getting to? I'm getting to that even as we, you may not have a whole lot of time in your curriculum to kind of go through dealing with the differences that are in the class, um, but we need to learn as much about our students as is possible. Now, I have um, a rhetorical question, which means I'm not looking for a response, but I just want you to think about it. How many of us will, in our classes, take uh, any significant amount of time, you can define significant as you will, take any amount of time to know who our students are. Okay, I'm not saying that no one does, but it is a very important step to take because to be successful in my teaching, I really need to know whom, or I will have people sitting in my class as you were. Is this kind of sitting? Um, I guess he'll explain, what is that again? And also having served on curriculum committees at different levels, I even looked at the, the course objectives and the course objectives are actually the cognitive level that we're expecting out of students really is kind of low in a lot of our courses because we have students will understand, blah, blah, blah. Students will know, da, 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 da. <clears throat> students will explain, that, oh, we're starting to get one. We're starting to get up there a little bit. But as far as analyze, apply, uh, di differentiate, those kinds of things, for looking at the course syllabi that have gone through for approval or revision over the past four years, we don't say too much about that. So it then becomes little surprise that many of the students leave our classes with appreciable growth in what we are trying to teach them. Okay? All right, so um, I'm going to have, I, I, want, I want to talk in just a little bit more. So there are, what is, while we're looking at all these pieces, what is something practical that I might do in my uh, class? I want to pull from a couple of educators, actually it's a husband and wife team, that offer one possible uh, approach to engaging students in a way that would be culturally relevant and uh, culturally responsive. I haven't really gone through that kind of detail because then it becomes, well, what do I do with all this? And actually some of our teacher candidates say, you mean I have a, a class of 26, 28, 32 students and, and some of us, we have a lecture class of 300, you know, 200 or so people. How am I gonna use this uh, sort of knowledge? Well, they offer one possible approach, and this is what I want uh, to share with us as well. Here's one. We'll start at the bottom. The one is intentionally disinviting. Intentionally disinviting, according to Wong and Wong, is where um, I may be rude to some of my students. Um, you know, it's like, well, you need to work hard. Uh, you can put forth more effort. That can intentionally, that's disinviting. Okay, you're not trying hard enough. Or, and I don't know how many people still do this. I remember doing this, having taken a lot of science. <laughs> and it's like, 
Uh, and you may have experienced this where someone says, all right, um, good morning, everybody. Glad that you're here. Um, about 50% um, of you are going to fail the course. <laughs> you know, so I might be thinking of another major. This is tough. It happens every time. I mean, about 50% fail. Uh, so work hard. <laughs> you know, that's the kind of thing. So there's these things come up, and we've had instances where someone will say um, uh, something, or uh, uh, I would rather be called, and, well, that's not what's on the roll. I'm going to call what's on the roll. That way I know you're here. You know, that can be disinvited. All right, so move, there's, there are many examples. Can you think of another one? Disinviting. Like when you ask a question and you get a response that isn't what you want, you have to kind of work hard to not make that a negative experience answering mm -hmm. the question. So mm -hmm. disinviting that way by <coughs> sort of punishing somebody for answering a yeah. question wrong. Yeah, it, and, and in fact, it almost screams, wrong! Yes. You are wrong! Don't ever give that answer again. Yeah. <laughs> I think another one is like when a student asks, well, when you ask, okay, are there any questions? And then there's silence and you say, good. So that insinuates that it's good to not have questions sometimes. Yeah. So that can be perceived as disinviting as well. Great one, great one. Gotta watch that. Gotta reach. All right, so here's another one. Um, here's another one where uh, it's unintentionally disinviting. That means I didn't mean anything by that. You know, and the, the intent is to uh, be cordial. And if I might say something, I may. Can I just say, ignorant, uh, without offending anyone, I can be ignorant of the uh, a piece of your background and say something unknowingly, I'm not educated enough to know not to say that, and I lose you by that. It can be a trigger, and a trigger is uh, anything that uh, uh, produces uh, an un well, uh, a natural response, and generally it's a strong response, and it's negative. Okay, so uh, I have to, you know, be aware of that. Let's pause here. We um, have a comment from online. You said cultural competence refers to the ability to help students appreciate and celebrate their cultures of origin while gaining knowledge of and fluency in at least one other culture. I'm a little confused about this point. Does that mean to participate with students from different cultures, such as celebration days, to show my attention and to get benefits from this culture? No, it does not mean that. Um, and I'm glad this question came up because I didn't really spend much time with it. Cultural competence has to do with knowing, appreciating who I am. And remember, if I do that in an authentic manner and raise my self-worth, that positions me then to learn from someone else who's from a different culture. So cultural competence is about taking care of oneself in a way that you can be mindful and inviting, using this language that we're talking about, inviting to someone else. That's what it, it means. So I hope uh, in the nugget that I answered this question, if not, I will gladly answer a follow-up question. Okay? So real quickly, moving on real quickly, then we go into uh, the unintentionally inviting. Unintentionally inviting has to do with uh, people who are uh, embracing and they engage individuals, but it's not in a knowing way. Maybe they're just nice people. And there are lots of nice people. But if and, but I'm not really cognizant that I'm having a positive impact on my students. Okay, well, I don't want to position this as a real bad thing. I just want to say that if I'm operating consistently at this level, this unintentionally invited, then I'm not at a point where I can purposefully duplicate. Okay? Um, which then brings in the intentionally inviting, the highest of all goods. I'm going to reach out uh, to students and um, 
engage them in a meaningful way. So, uh, for example, I have been slipping in here one uh, instructional practice I use a lot in my classroom, and then a, a lot of us educators do use it. It's called Think Pair Share. Okay, let's review real quickly. Um, for the Think Pair Share, remember I offered a question at different times. Then what did I do? Pardon? Asked us to share. Yes. Okay, and then after you share, then we go to, all right, does anybody want to uh, let us in on what you discuss? No. It's not working too well today, but what that, what that uh, instructional strategy is designed to do is designed to relax people and to set them up for participation with that saying, I don't want to be wrong. If I'm, I know I'm the only one thinking this, so I don't think I'll say much of anything. Because now you've in, interacted with some individuals, someone else, yeah, I was thinking the same thing. Oh, good, that emboldens me a little bit. Okay, so that can be one way. The other is not, um, I may not, I don't know all the cultures that are in this room, but I have to accept that they're, um, that they're different, even to the point where, if you allow me, there are two African-American males besides me here, right? It is, it is socially, it is academically dangerous to put them in one box. They, they may have come, I'm, a, I'm going to assume that you all are from different physical locations and that you're different ages probably and they've had different experiences. So even at that point, that stops us then from putting people in boxes. <laughs> um, and you know, so far, because I may have had an experience where I was working with a person with glasses had difficulty, and I know some of you were in glasses, but I was working with this person with glasses, they had difficulty uh, getting this concept, so people with glasses are gonna have difficulty with this. You know, we have to, it's about learning each other. Call, uh, this whole thing is about learning from our students also. So what I'm encouraging us to do is set ourselves up that even while we're teaching in our various courses, to also characterize ourselves as learn and to continue to learn. That's going to actually make our teaching better, which is one of the things that we're focusing on here. Okay? All right. So uh, to get on with our brief amount of time, so these are some of the works that I cited here. There are many more. What I want to do now is... Uh, take a moment, and I know there's some feedback on the sheet, but I want us to take a moment, we're almost done, uh, I, uh, to once again, we're going to do kind of like a think pair share, I want us to now think about, at this point, based on the little information that we're given, is how might I use this information to inform my teaching? When I say this information, I'm talking about this presentation. Okay, this is not about me, it's about us. Okay, what, how might I, uh, how might I apply this to my team? No one asking the question in this place. Okay, and then we'll collect some representative, uh, or some responses and start to close. Okay, go ahead, take a moment. How might I use this? Um, we don't have time for everybody to share, but is there anyone who would care to share? Uh, one of the points that you discussed, the t one of the takeaways, yes, ma'am. We had two big ideas. Uh, the first one is that another way to be unintentionally disinviting is to use too much jargon and acronyms and language that isn't normal vocabulary. Great. And then the second idea that we had is, you know, in engineering and science, I think there's a tendency to assume culture doesn't matter to what we're teaching. We're not having discussions of a personal nature. Mm -hmm. And I would argue that by saying culture doesn't matter, you're establishing a culture unintentionally. Mm -hmm. And it's probably not going to be the one that we want to. Great. Great. Anyone else have a burning one? <clears throat> 
Okay, I appreciate your attention, your participation. Another uh, good important thing is the more actively engaged, or the more we actively engage our students, the more we're going to lend ourselves to be intentionally invited as well. A lot more to address with this, but I hope you have some nuggets to take with you. If you would, please fill, uh, complete the course. I mean, the course evaluation. <laughs> <laughs> the presentation evaluation. Um, I think Laurie is near the door who will collect those. Feel free to take our social media one. Uh, I just tweeted um, uh, something where an uh, instructor in a large biology class how she has uh, reached out in a way that we're talking to deal with her uh, students. So those of you who, thank you. Those of you who uh, uh, teach large classes, it was, uh, there's a nice article, it's a short one to read. Um, also, we have our social media card. Uh, please join us in, in one or more of the social media venues. We have coming up on March 29th, the Ed, um, the Ed Tech or Education Technology Showcase. Uh, we won our first go last year. We're going to do it again this year. It'll be at the Russell House on March 29th. We have a dynamic keynote speaker. Uh, I believe, Xavier, this is online? Yes. It's um, right there on the events calendar. Yes. The registration is. I'm going to do, yes. Um, and then if you subscribe to Alyssa, you receive more notices about the upcoming Ed Tech Showcase. Yes. So we invite you to that. I think there's zero dollars for registration as well. Can't beat zero. <laughs> so um, please join us then also. Have a great weekend. Thank you. Thank you.